Good morning, Wabash. Good morning, Wabash. Today speaking at Pioneer Chapel is Eliza Shadwick, Malcolm Lang, James Love, Alan Johnson Jr., and Malik Barnes with their talk entitled The Legacy of the Marginalized. Eli Shadwick is a Spanish major and econ minor, an Indianapolis native. Eli is an independent and is the RA of Martindale Hall and the chair of the alumni committee of the Malcolm X Institute. Following his graduation, Eli will work for Target Regional Distribution Center and hopes to one day open an affordable housing company. Malcolm Lang is an English major with a minor in black studies and psychology. He was born in Chicago, but was raised in Hammond, Indiana. Malcolm serves as the current chairman of the Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies, a member of Sons of Wabash, and a member of the Wabash track and football team. James is an art, art major with a minor in creative writing. Born in Indianapolis, James is a brother of Teak and is currently serving as, the chair, as a chair of the MXI and a member of Shout. Alan Johnson Jr. was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. He is a freshman and independent and a member of the golf team. Alan is planning to major in psychology with a minor in black studies. Alan plans to pursue a career in sports psychology or communication after graduation. Malik Barnes is a freshman PPE major from Marion, Arkansas. Malik is an independent who serves the class of 2023 senator, a campus ambassador, and a member of the Red Zone Leadership Committee. Following graduation, Malik intends to go to law school and hopefully become a judge one day. Please join me in welcoming Malik Barnes. Good morning, Wabash. Good morning, Malik. Today I'm going to be talking about unity and tolerance. And I'm going to start with unity. So we're going to start in 1903, six years before the NAACP was founded. And Wabash was already taking a stance here in little old Crawfordsville. <laughs> when uh, uh, Coach Wilson had just got a telegraph from what is now known as Rose Holman, saying that they would not uh, play Wabash if Wabash allowed their African-American player, Sam Gordon, to play. Emeritus President William Kane said, well, if they will not play with all of our team, then they won't play with any of our team. And that is just one example how one brother's problem became all brother's problem. Next, I'm going to be talking about tolerance, specifically in education. Many of us come from very, from, 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 excuse me, from very different backgrounds, some of us not even experiencing any of the uh, other cultures and races besides that, that of our own. With that being said, we must have these conversations to build understanding and gain this tolerance among each other. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. Just make sure you articulate it respectfully. And, and for those of us who, who, who are those minority groups, don't be afraid to answer those questions. Make sure you articulate them respectfully. With that being said, I want to I wanna take this as a call for unity. We are in this together. When we say Wabash always fights, we say Wabash always fights, not some of Wabash always fights. As we sing old Wabash today after this chapel talk, I urge you to reflect on our past memories of who we are as, as an institution and the legacy that, that we have set in this country. Thank you. Good morning, Wabash. As we are gathered here today for this chapel talk, I want to speak to you all for a few moments about what this month means to me and some importance about what Black History Month and marginalization also means to me. February, the shortest month of the year, 28 days and occasionally 29 like this year, holds the responsibility of chartering the most historic, lavished, and important holiday months of the year. To begin, I want all of you to take some time today, think of an African-American figure in your life, write it down on a post-it note or in your phone, and go back to it when you forget about it and when you think about what black history meant. Now, in many black history talks, you might hear about Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Harriet Tubman, Jackie Robinson, and Rosa Parks, just to name a few figures who have this wow factor in the black experience. I stand before you today and say that marginalization is a killer. If we do not educate ourselves about our history, um, ignorance will continue to be a part of our society. Yes, I said our history. Black history, no matter if you're a white, Hispanic, Chinese, Asian, 
or Indian is a part of American history and should be treated as such. If you consider yourself as an American or part of this country, when we speak about black history, it should hold some weight with you. I want to focus on some figures that have been marginalized in their own black history, um, although their effect is still great. One of those figures is Mr. W.E.B. Du Bois, a sociologist, socialist, civil rights activist, and author of many important pieces of literature, including The Souls of Black Folks. He was also the first African American to graduate from Harvard with a PhD. Now, this might amaze some of you, others it might not. It is very important to this history. If you have some time today, look up who Du Bois is and read up on his effect on this country's literature and education system, as it may spark some of your interest. Others who are marginalized in this country's history outside of African Americans are women, as we might know. As women have been such important pieces of our lives and history, we have yet to give them the full recognition as they should get, and I am an advocate that we should do so. With that being said, another figure that is relative to this talk is Ms. Mary McCloy Bethune. If you've heard this name, please raise your hand. Ms. Bethune was the child of a former slave. She was an advocate on the thought of education providing the key to racial advancement. This, in terms, would help her with the founding of Daytona, Daytona Normal and Industrial Institute in 1904, which will become, later, Bethune-Cookman College down in Daytona Beach, Florida. Now, as she is a strong woman in her aspects of higher education and activism with civil rights, her marginalization in African-American history and culture is ridiculous. This is just one of many figures who is marginalized and who don't have that wow factor on paper but have so many volumes that speak high to all of us. Now, as these people have been marginalized from their own respects in African-American history, we as a campus have marginalized some of the history that we know. Wabash in his own has its own African-American history, yet many of us have not heard it. If you have heard the name John W. Evans, please raise your hand. Mr. Evans was the first African-American to graduate from Wabash in 1908. Now, as he does mean a lot to this campus, not many of us have heard of his name. Another name that, I, that came to mind when we talked about women and people who have worked on this campus in our black history is Ms. Jasmine Robinson. If you have heard this name, please raise your hand. Ms. Robinson was the first African-American woman to work on this campus as a faculty member and served so many lives with her open-mindedness, her love to converse, and the peace that she brought students on this campus although it is not acknowledged or talked about. Countless people walk into the MXI computer lab every single day to print out papers, do reports, and yet don't know what the computer lab or who the computer lab is named after. Again, it's time to start this change with us, to recognize our own history, our own black history. Let us continue to grow as a campus and respect our black history, not just in February, but every single day. All history is important, whether small or big, and we should make sure that even though somebody has the loudest voice, they might not have the greatest effect, so let's do our research. If you feel compelled to have more conversations, want to educate yourself, or just want to be a part of a brotherhood inside of the brotherhood, please come and join the MXI. It is open to all races, all colors of skin, all sexual orientations, political views, and anyone who just feels the need to help with diversity and racial advancement on campus. We would love to have you as a member. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so I heard I have five minutes, and that's, that's the cap for it. So I'm going to be talking about black culture starting now. <laughs> black culture. What exactly is it? Me, personally, I could explain it in a very longer time span, but five minutes, I could sum up black culture as black experience. Let's talk about that. Black experience is anger, fear, beauty, and power. Anger, well, I'm angry because many of my brothers and sisters, African-Americans, are being gunned down and slaughtered 
because cops are trigger happy. I know there are good cops out there, don't get me wrong, but the media hasn't necessarily proved that, now has it? I'm also angry because I can't walk into Crawfordsville without being stared down and being seen as a threat, a criminal, a commodity, or anything else. I've walked into a CVS, Susan. I'm just here to get some setting spray and walk out. That's all it is. <laughs> I'm scared, highlight it in fear, because every day I live, it might be my last. Literally just walking down the street, driving in a car with my brothers and my sisters, my mom, and at any given moment, we could be pulled over and anything can escalate just because I might have to pull out my wallet, I have a hairbrush in my hand, and it might be seen as a weapon. These glasses might be seen as a weapon if any given person might have just perceived it differently and then it's my fault. Beauty, because after 300 to 400 years of enslavement, we have still been able to change protective hairstyles into a work of art for African American women and men alike. We have box braids, weaves, and so many other things that help African American hair grow and flourish and thrive, even though we've been told consistently that it's been ugly and not wanted in any given professional stance. It is power because after every single century of enslavement and decades going on forth of segregation, Jim Crow and being looked upon as nothing, less than nothing, animals being hunted down and slaughtered. There's an actual organization that hunts us down among other minorities. Can, can we talk about that for a minute? But, Alas, I have two more minutes, so I can't. <laughs> so let me switch over to my notes. I wrote out a closing. If you are a white or non-black minority person, just whoever, and you have so-called black friends, I say so-called because most people don't show up when it most counts. When there's another Trayvon Martin, when there's another I honestly can't think of the names because there's so many, you know? The media has centered on so many unknown names that just go off into the mist, never to be thought of again. Just because you like and retweet something that has somebody's name on it because they got murdered by a cop doesn't make you an activist. So if you want to be with us, if you want to respect the culture, if you want to be with us in that culture, let me rephrase, if you want to respect it, not imitate it, there's a difference. Be there with us with the, in the front lines when another one of us, us, is shot down mercilessly for no given reason because a cop felt threatened by our presence. I can't stand for it. So, in my closing, I am more than your token black friend that you can wave around and show everybody to prove you're not a racist. That goes for everybody. I am not a joke. I am more than the guy you come to when you want the N-word pass just so that you can be cool in front of everybody else. Yeah, I took notice of that too. I am more than just entertainment for the masses or mass us if you want to go there. I am more than a trend and a damn punchline. I am human. I have a history that needs to be respected. I have an actual word for my particular race that needs to be respected. No, you cannot say it because that is meant for us, by us, because we took it back. My name is James Edward Love III. I will not be denied. I will not be silenced, I will not be erased, I will not be slaughtered, and I will not be anonymous. Thank you. Uh, 
good morning, Wabash. I got nerves, so bear with me, please. Uh, as much as I talk in front of people on a daily basis, uh, I'm still nervous, so bear with me. Um, so for the past few days, I reflected on the meaning of Black History Month and how it's supposed to function. Uh, but as a, a member of the Malcolm X Institute, as well as a Black Studies minor, uh, I was kind of confused, and I wasn't quite sure what to say to all of you. Um, I didn't know whether I should talk about uh, my experience with black history, uh, what I've learned, or what I think is important. Uh, but after a while, I felt compelled to describe what this month means to me, not only as a young man, but also as a black scholar, uh, and a portion of what it should mean to all of you guys. Um, um, so where do I start? In 1915, uh, men by the names of Carter G. Woodson and Jesse E. Moreland were the founders of what is now the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Uh, this association was created because of the lack of representation and education of black figures who have also shaped American history. In 1926, the association went on to do a press release and announce Negro History Week in the second week of February to encompass and acknowledge the birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and uh, also Frederick Douglass. And a mere 50 years later in 1976, uh, because of Woodson and Moreland's inv uh, advances, uh, Black History Month would officially become uh, Black History Month, uh, created and promoted nationwide. Along with this, uh, they set the foundation for someone like, uh, someone like Nathan Hare to coordinate the first ever Black Studies program in this country. Um, so you guys can see that uh, the basis of Black History Month is to educate, right? Um, a grand portion of Black History uh, encompasses a collection of figures, contributions, and feats of Black people, uh, honoring those who came before us, the trailblazers who had an everlasting desire to liberate their people. Um, but after internalizing Black History Month and my experiences with it and what I've learned in just my short time here at Wabash, uh, I also think that this time period is a short reminder of the responsibility, uh, the responsibility that black people have for uh, their people and their culture. Um, over time, I feel like the month of black history uh, has become a bit formulaic. And what I mean by that is that all of us spend like 28, occasionally 29, as AJ mentioned, uh, 29 days out of the year to acknowledge and educate ourselves on a few black people uh, in black history. Uh, only a few, but nonetheless, it's still a celebration, right? But uh, the celebratory aspect uh, shouldn't far exceed the activism and involvement needed to carry on the advancements of our predecessors. Uh, a portion of Black History Month that we have to embrace myself included, is the activism. It's the proactivity. The same proactivity that seven black students used in creating the Afro House in 1967, which would become the Malcolm X Institute three years later. Um, if it wasn't for their sacrifices, their dedication, and uh, their honor for black history and black culture, uh, we wouldn't be on the verge of celebrating 50 illustrious years of the Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies. This organization uh, changed my life and made me reconsider what it means to be uh, a black man, a black scholar. Uh, it made me reconsider like the responsibility I have as well as uh, what I represent as a member of the Malcolm X Institute. Uh, but what I do know is within and outside of the parameters of the Wabash community, uh, it is our duty to preserve and honor this history. Uh, as those same people who created the Afro House, the advancement agency are in the hands of the students. Uh, we have the power to change our environment, to change a portion of our circumstances. And if not now, at least have the, the power to set the foundation for the people after us to do so. Um, we're, pri we're privileged to be an apparatus where we can pride ourselves in attacking issues head on. Uh, we're privileged to carry the torch of, of black advancement and, and black involvement. Uh, it is our responsibility to create and preserve a space of, of not only social equality, but cultural equality. And along with that, diversity of ideas, cultures, and people. Uh, we have to remove ourselves from our comfort zone to ensure that the people that come after us are comfortable in their environment, um, in their setting. Uh, though this is primarily the framework of the Malcolm X Institute, uh, it is also a mission to be carried by the entire Wabash College. Um, so in closing, I guess, uh, this month to me serves as a reminder as to why we have to keep striving for unity and combating the, the um, complexities of racial inequality. 
this is a duty that spans outside of the boundaries of February. Uh, in order to dismantle uh, a legacy of marginalization, uh, we must build the legacy of black people and all other races uh, as pillars of American history. Thank you. My bad. I got to uh, channel my inner Tim Duncan for this one. But uh, good morning, Wabash. So uh, Malcolm X was an orator, an orator known for his candid manner of addressing social issues in America. He did not beat around the bush, nor did he avoid topics that may make others uncomfortable. Today, I plan to be no different. Since its inception, Black History Month has been an opportunity to commemorate the accomplishments of ex exceptional African Americans. However, this is not a blatant aversion to the bloody and violent side of black history, both in February and the rest of the year, too. If we are to remember the Emancipation Proclamation, we must too remember the rare summer of 1919, when over a thousand people, majority African Americans, some of whom were returning soldiers from World War I, that were killed in race riots. If we are to remember the Million Man March, we must also remember Bloody Sunday in Selma. Behind every great, great black accomplishment, there are countless stories we will never hear. Silenced by the discrimination and violence perpetuated through institutional racism and xenophobia of all things that are not considered white. Too often, we criticize the contemporary issues of African Americans without acknowledging the systems of oppression that brought them about. You all may know of African Americans' weariness of the government, but how many of you know that the dis this distrust stems from horrors such as the 40-year government-ran experiment, uh, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that ended in 1972. This experiment, under the guise of a free checkup, gave nearly 400 black men syphilis without their permission, I might add, in a pre-penicillin era that killed majority of those involved. You all know the dangers of the south side of Chicago and the amount of lives that are lost there each year. But how many lives could have been saved if not for the discrimina discriminatory redlining of minority neighborhoods? Discrimination that prevented the construction of a much needed trauma center. I do not expect you all to understand uh, the struggles of being a black man, of explaining to your incarcerated father that he is institutionalized. A conversation held on a cell phone that could ruin his chance of probation. I do not expect you to understand the feeling in the pit of your stomach when looking down the barrel of a gun. The man behind the trigger, a fellow black man, who has every intent of killing you if you do not do, not do as he says. In order to understand that the emotions you feel in that situation are not anger or rage, but pain and sorrow. Pain and sorrow that this is what the members of my race Feel must be done to survive. This is a part of my black history. And nearly every African American in this room probably has a similar story about themselves or someone they know. I think I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on my experience, not for myself, but for those who cannot speak on their own trials and tribulations. Us speaking here today is evidence of how far African Americans have come. And I tell you these things not for your pity or for your empathy, but to highlight how much further we have to go. I did not come here today to ask that any of you solve the issues that plague African American communities, because that must happen internally and over generations. However, I do ask that we present and teach the aspects of black history that are painful to remember. I ask that we celebrate exceptional black women of American history as much as we do black men because they are doubly at risk of marginalization at the crossroads of sexism and racism. I ask that we educate the future generations <clears throat> on black history, hand in hand with white history, as a singular American history, not hopes that others will understand the African American experience, but to learn where we came from and where we must go next as a people and as a nation, and leave our violent past as just that, the past. If you disagree with me, Feel as if I have spoken inaccurately, or merely want to, <clears throat> I merely want to educate yourself and others. Join the MXI and let's talk about it. Thank you.
Uh, before, we, before we finish, we're going to recite the motto and creed of the Malcolm X Institute for everyone that knows it and for the rest of you, listen and maybe figure it out. Here at Wabash College, in my community, and in my world. Ram's horns, humility, 